Happy Hump Day. Welcome back to Looking Backwards, Looking Forwards. I'm C. Thomas Printer, and I'm here with Austerity Jones. Happy Wednesday, C. Thomas. The House finally has a speaker. After 15 rounds of voting, McCarthy, why did it take so long and how has he finally managed to be elected? I haven't seen 15 rounds that brutal since Rocky Balboa won the title from Apollo Creed in Rocky II. They both recovered, but Apollo was never the same. And I feel like the Republican Party might not be the same. I, I think this shows, and the elections actually showed, that the Republicans' um, grasp on where they think they're at is not exactly where the public has them at. And th- the key thing here was there is a small subsegment of about 20 of the, the members of the House that are not buying in to playing the regular rules of politics, right? You have some fringe members of them that the media is, of course, crucifying, um, and perhaps for proper reasons. But here's the thing. I hate them all. I think all of Congress is corrupt. I think all of Congress is an abomination. So anybody that says, we don't like what you guys are all doing, boy, by default, I'm almost tempted to side with them. And boy, I don't like my allies here. So I think that's what you're seeing is like this is going to set up for a future conflict, whether it's about the debt ceiling or another issue. But we're going to have something where these people are going to dig their heels in and they're just going to be like, yeah, no, we're not doing this. Right. Like there has to be someone that says, no, we're going to stop this. Right. And Trump came in and he tried to smooth things over and get it to go. They weren't buying that either. Right. So this is a different element of saying no we have to stop spending money here, Congress, or, you know, we have to behave better and we have to do things instead of just creating more inflation. And I guess I kind of like that, even though I don't like my allies. Noted. And um, let's go to the other side of the ocean. We have already talked about nuclear regaining popularity, but I found this interesting. Even a country like Japan, <laughs> who had the Fukushima disaster in a very recent date, is seeing increased support for nuclear restart. Yes, you know, Japan had a fairly extensive nuclear profile there for a while, and then all of a sudden they had the the disaster in Fukushima with the earthquake, and then they promptly said, oh, we've got to shut all this down. And then they said, well, how are we going to get energy? And now it's been a decade, and now they're saying, you know what, nuclear wasn't that bad. We really, really don't like getting 9% of our natural gas from Russia and because you know we're supposed to be siding with the Americans with these sanctions. And if we don't do that, oh my gosh, it's really expensive buying from the Americans because they have a very high cost of production. Um, and now all of a sudden our currencies dropped 30% in the last year. And you know what, nuclear is not so bad. Well, nuclear was never so bad, Japan. You had an accident. That is a problem, right? Earthquakes of that magnitude are very, very rare. But if you think you're just going to automatically turn that off and still have your standard of living without that kind of a cheap baseload power source, you're mistaken. Right. And what do you think about the markets in the first week of the new year, C. Thomas? It started in the red, but managed to close the week in the green. Can we drive any implications for the rest of the year based on this? Well, Friday being up 700 points in the Dow, that was um, very exuberant. I think of what the dollar milkshake theory founder, Brent Johnson, uh, said on Twitter, he from Santiago Capital, he said that a very wise man once told him that he doesn't even pay attention to the first week of the year, <laughs> right? And it's kind of <laughs> like my uh, philosophy with partying on New Year's, on New Year's Eve, right? That's the day for amateurs. If you're a partier, you party <laughs> the rest of the year, all right? Don't, don't buy into all the chaos and the overpriced champagne and covers and everything else, right? It's the same thing you're going to go do on October 17th if you want to go out, but they're just charging you more. So I don't think we pay a lot of, ten- of attention to it. I th- do think that when we get these big rips, these one-day rips, I think what you're seeing is the underlying desperational hope that people have with FOMO. Like, oh, we've reached the bottom now. It's going to go up. Why would it go up right now, right? Like, why? 
the bull case is very, very um, flimsy other than um, there's going to be a pivot, right? This is the whole reason is every time you see the market up, oh, the market thinks they're going to pivot. How long have these guys have been saying, we're not pivoting for a year. We might slow down the pace of raises, but we're not going down for a year. So I think the market doesn't believe the Fed. I think mm. the market also says you're full of it and that you are going to pivot. And the Fed is saying no. And so basically, you figure out what the Fed is going to do. You can figure out what the market is going to do. And to give that amount of power to just a few people or specifically one person, Jerome Powell, that's a very, very flimsy way for a world's largest economy to run. Hmm. Yes, I mean, you already touched upon a little. Um, I want to ask you your expectations regarding the December CPI. It will come out tomorrow. Do you think that would have an effect on Fed decision later this month? Well, yes, if it was big enough, right? We're, we're talking about just the levels here, right? If it was a sharp okay. drop, perhaps. The labor report came out and we have 3.5%. Um, unemployment and the fed said you know we're going to have to have the jobs market reverse mm. it hasn't reversed right and so i think people are reading too much into these you know the the nuances of some of these things when what we really need is more fundamental shifts and so um i i do think the cpi right if you look in a year over year basis we were starting to see some pretty big jumps last year so i think we'll see some percentage year over year rate of change coming down But that doesn't solve the underlying problem, right? And the underlying problem is, is in every cycle of inflation, the Fed has had to take the rate over the rate of inflation. And for them to do so, they are currently at four and a half, inflation's at seven. So CPI is going to have to come underneath the Fed funds rate in order for this to happen, mm -hmm. or the PCE or whatever, you know, the Fed wants to look at specifically. But I just still think when you have inflation at seven, even rates at four and a half, you're still in an accommodative stance. You're not in a restrictive stance. And so when the Fed comes out, like Bullard came out the other day and said, we might have to go to seven, and people just laughed at him. And then I thought back, hmm, I remember having these conversations in January of last year, and people were saying, I think the Fed's going to go to three and a half or four, and people laughed at those people. Right. And it's like we need to adjust our expectations and what we think can't happen can happen. That's part of being open minded mm -hmm. and people to say that, no, you can't you can't do that. We'll just go back a year and look. Right. People were saying the market would break if we went to two and a half. That's what happened in 2018. We blew by two and a half a long time ago and we're still kicking and the labor market's still low. So something under, underneath the surface has fundamentally changed. And I'm not sure what it is. Okay. Wow. <laughs> Sorry, I'm being long-winded today, but <laughs> and uh, well, then let's see what you have to say about uh, crypto. So, although viewed as a strong go-to for people looking to guard their savings against inflation, the crypto world is facing bankruptcies. As uh, one of the consequences, U.S. bank Silvergate has been hit with. Eight billion dollars in crypto withdrawals. The last answer did take a little long, and I apologize for that. So I'll make it short. Crypto bad, <laughs> gold good. There, there's your answer. I'm kidding. Okay. I'm kidding. Okay. Right. So uh, there's 20. I would. I looked it up this morning. There's 21,910 cryptocurrencies out there. They're all making up their own money. These are all these tokens that you can use for these purposes. And then what we're seeing is. Oh, yeah, this was a Ponzi scheme. This one's going bankrupt. Oh, yeah, this is a Ponzi scheme. This is going mm -hmm. bankrupt. It doesn't matter whether it's a chain letter, whether it's Madoff, whether it's any of these companies doing pump and dump on stocks like Bed Bath and Beyond just filed for bankruptcy. But last year, you know, these people were pumping this up with the memes and the Reddit boards. Crypto is absolutely filled with this right now. And I don't know, and I'm not smart enough to figure out a good one from a bad one. There will be lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of bankruptcies in this world coming down the road. Now, the good actors, we will see, right? Bitcoin is holding in at 16,000. Bitcoin, unlike 
every other one that I've seen it does have a limited number of tokens, which is probably the first and most important thing you should look at when it comes to crypto because it has a limited number of tokens. Therefore, you can't inflate the, heck, the thing to oblivion, kind of like our fiat money system is doing, but that's another conversation. But this is what you're going to see is um, the Terra Luna fallout, the SBF fallout, and now people are just not trusting crypto. And so this U.S. Bank Silvergate is having $8 billion in withdrawals. That's people just not trusting the system and taking money out of this, right? And so we need to let that sort it out. The good actors will be there, the ones that have solid business plans. I don't know what they are. Most people don't. It's very hard to do due diligence in some of these areas. And then what we'll see is who's standing in three, four, five years, right? Is Bitcoin still standing? Does it have a use case? Is Ether the mm -hmm. one? We'll see. So we cannot end an episode without talking about inflation. European inflation, it was announced on Friday that Eurozone annual inflation was 9.2% year on year in December, down from 10.1% in November. This made the inflation figure finally drop from the realm of double digits in Europe. Yes, it's dropping, right? Just like we talked in America, though. What's the European Central Bank rate at right now? Is it two, two and a half? That's a long ways from 9.2 yeah, right. year over year, right? And so <laughs> they are still in accommodative stance. They have not incentivized savers to save when I'm losing 9.2% of my money year over year, I should go spend it because my money is going to be worth less. If they had interest rates at 10%, I would say, oh, wow, I'm going to get a 10% savings rate. I will save my money. And therefore, that will bring down demand and that will slow financial conditions. And they're just not doing that yet, right? They are behind even worse than, you know, everyone's blaming Jay Powell for inflation is transitory. Mm -hmm. He is ahead of the whole world. Just, you know, with very few exceptions, right? Russia, they raised mm -hmm. their interest rates when we put sanctions on them. Brazil was ahead of the curve, right? They, they've stayed on top of their inflation rate, even though they're in double digits now on their, on their mm -hmm. Fed funds rate. But the Eurozone is, as you can see, just by the numbers, severely lacking in that, you know, and they have an energy crisis over there that's not going away. It's got some really nice weather. Ski resorts are being closed down. You can wear shorts and was it Austria the other day? <laughs> um, that's pretty rare for, rare for January over there. That's fine. There will be some weather. It's still winter. And then we will see how they try to, try to um, replenish those supplies going forward. Everyone thinks they just have to get through one year, but that's not it, right? They're going to have to fight this forever now, right? Are they really going to pay the exorbitant prices to ship natural gas and to use the uh, LNG process to get it across the ocean. That's not a very good thing for them, right? We saw what Japan did. They put their nuclear reactors back in because they're like, wow, this is really expensive. This is not a good idea. I haven't seen that much or those kind of ideas coming out of Europe just because they're so stuck on their, their green initiatives over there. And they're just not very economically you know, palatable. Thank you very much, C. Thomas. Thank you, Austerity. Until <laughs> next week, don't buy a car you can't push. Since we know that you don't have enough time to find and read all the resources you need, we have compiled them for you in our blog and our YouTube channel because we want you to be the most informed person in your room.